Sonra uykudan önce rica ettim. Şu nereden yaptıysa ki sonra. Sonra fark ettim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Let's start today's session with the recitation of Surah Al-Fatihah. Okay, so uh, Juman Barak, everyone, especially our distinguished speaker, uh, Prof. Ahmed Ben-Azadeh, Director of CID Prof. Norma, who should be here soon, and our head of department, Dr. Aski, and other esteemed faculty members, uh, researchers, our students, and uh, anybody who has joined us in person and who is joining us from a different time zone from different parts of the world. Welcome to the KENMS Distinguished Intellectual Discourse Series. My name is Riyasat Amin Iman with the Department of Economics, and I'll be managing today's event. Uh, first, some background uh, of this program. Okay, uh, many of you are here to, uh, of course, uh, benefit from uh, Prof. Asate's uh, speech, but also today marks the third installment of our Distinguished Intellectual Discourse series. Some of you already know that uh, the series has been ongoing. The previous two um, uh, installments of this series were developed by, uh, sorry, were delivered by Prof. Tarikula Khan and uh, Prof. Jomo uh, Many of you will also know that this series was created to highlight some of the key themes for our upcoming conference, the 15th ICIEF, to be held at the end of this year, specifically from the 5th to the 7th of December. The title of the 15th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance is Driving the Agenda for a Sustainable Humane Economy. The conference not only seeks the usual academic insights from and the conference not, not only seeks the usual academic insights from the greatest intellectual minds of the world, but hopes to connect those minds to the policy apparatus that is key for making those brilliant insights a reality. Today's talk, a discussion of morality in Islamic economics, is a crucial part of that discourse. And I can't think of a better person than Prof. Mehmet Asuzi to deliver this talk. Frankly speaking, our speaker, Prof. Mehmet, doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll indulge you anyway. Um, Prof. Mehmet Asuzi is the director of, of the Durham Center for Islamic Economics and Finance. He's also the director of the MSc Finance Program at the university. Um, he's very, he's a key figure in shaping the intellectual discourse in Islamic economics and finance. Um, some of the roles he plays in that capacity is he's the managing editor of the Review of Islamic Economics. He's the associated, uh, associate editor of the American Journal of Islamic Social Science. And he's the member of the editorial board for International Journal of Islamic and Middle Eastern Finance and Management, as well as the Borsa of Istanbul Review. His present research focuses on the construction of the Islamic moral political economy, which he believes should form the framework for an Islamic moral or social economy, something that Islamic economics has always aspired for, but is yet to achieve. His, uh, his intellectual output covers an incredible range, including areas like Islamic worldview, the Maqasid al-Sharia, including uh, social welfare and well-being, intellectual capital formation and performance, uh, Islamic accounting and finance, corporate governance and social responsibility, the halal economy, fintech, and Islamic equity management and digital currencies. So you can see um, you know, uh, how prolific his uh, area is. And if I keep talking about our speaker, we will not have time to actually hear him speak. 
So on that note, um, on the topic reconstituting Islamic economics as an Islamic moral economy, I am very honored to invite Prof. Mehman to the podium. Um, this will be a discourse-based uh, session, meaning to say that as um, Prof. Mehman speaks, and you know, you may interject with his permission. And um, so the idea, since it's a small group, we'll be able to have a very interesting session. So um, keeping that in mind, maybe. Thank you. I'll manage your slides for me. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, it has been some time that I haven't uh, traveled to Malaysia. The COVID, of course, uh, last time I was in uh, uh, Sheikh Kuala Lumpur 2019, August. Uh, so it has been some time. So it is good to be here around your friends, uh, but also uh, Malaysia is the, the heart, the Islamic finance. The, the challenges, development, progress. Uh, these are exciting stories. Uh, uh, to be able to reflect on those stories uh, is important. But also importantly, IIM um, is a very important institution of the Muslim world. Um, they will not entirely to create the knowledge base uh, in, and then reflecting on that knowledge base um, in everyday life and the experience of it. Uh, and therefore, it's good to be um, in the IIM, and um, it's a pleasure to be and thank you for having me. Uh, I understand that it has been uh, uh, long uh, days, a uh, couple of days, and therefore uh, um, people are tired, but uh, I'll try my best. So uh, we have a long session, but I, I don't mean to just present what I had, but rather to have a discussion and debate on the issues. The title, um, as you can see, it is um, very challenging, very challenging, but at the same time, um, suggest that uh, there has to be a new configuration, new ideas, new ways of expressing things. And the question is why we should reconsider it. In particular, in uh, speaking at the IIBM, I have to be very careful in that reconstituting. Uh, because um, somehow, in particular with the practice of Islamic finance, uh, some of us will feel that um, we have reached the end of history, the end of history of Islam, so we have Islamic banks, everything is done. But on the other hand, there, there is this intellectual as well as the practical discontent. Always we come back to that question, is Islamic finance Islamic enough? So that debate. And that debate tells us that um, there's something perhaps not fitting enough, satisfactory enough even to convince ourselves that whatever the conference that we have, such as the 15th conference is coming, most of the debate will be on how Islamic is the Islamic finance, one way or another. Uh, so it is an ongoing debate. And the reason I feel that um, the debate is there is haunting us, and I use the word haunting, is because um, we rushed very much quickly to look into how we can do the capital moments before understanding how this whole idea, the world view, and its implications in relation to Islamic economics and finance firms. And I feel, again, um, I have to be very careful being in AIM, but perhaps that economics, um, economics uh, word that we have in Islamic in front of um, after after Islamic or economics in front of Islamic, perhaps we have some problems there. Why economics, for instance? Because when we deconstruct the words, we get meanings. And economics, by definition, suggests a particular worldview and mm -hmm. particular value system, which may not necessarily reflect what we are trying to express. Because economics, by definition, um, is economizing, optimizing, and efficiency oriented. But on the other hand, Islam has a different value system and therefore defines human in a particular way. So the definition of human is starts from there. Because in the economics, you define individual as rational, self-maximizing, and etc. But then you turn Islam, no, that's not an, an Islamic individual, Islamic human. That human is expected to the Fala uh, to be considerate uh, of the 
of the uh, welfare of the society, other people, and etc. So as you can see, the world views immediately provides different definitions. But unfortunately, in that economic step, when we deconstruct that economics, we will find that, well, perhaps it is not necessarily helping us to ex explain. And therefore, um, I see over the last 50 years, methodologically, we have different schools of thoughts emerge. One is the um, Islamization of knowledge. Of course, IAM is an important place for, or it was an important place for that. And of course, within Islamization of knowledge, you have the Faruqi school, um, you have the Atlas school. Uh, one would consider um, very much on the surface of Islamization, and Atlas school will consider the substance related Islamization. Um, and also, you have the realistic school. Realistic schools will tell you that, look, guys, you know, this is reality. Market, market system, economic system, everything is there. So for us, what is important, how uh, we can provide some Islamic um, content to that to make it Islamic. Okay? And then the behavioral school will say that, look, whatever around you doesn't matter as long as you are a Muslim. Okay? So that will exclude the structural nature of the question, the structure, the market system, the distribution, the modes of production, production function, etc. That doesn't matter. Uh, and, and then the historical school. Now, historical school in recent years have, been, have become more dominant because, like in your part of the world, in this part of the world, a lot of studies on Bach and Zekat and all that, saying that, that we have these historical institutions. Um, and since um, the reality is here, how we can bring those historical institutions to make a difference. But again, that historical school um, does not look at the whole political economy of the issues of moral economy. Yes, what was important part of the everyday life in history, but today we have a different social contract. Uh, we have a nation state as opposed to uh, empires that we used to have. We have a nation state. With nation state, we are citizens, as we used to be subject of the sultan in the past. And it wasn't in sultan's responsibility to provide health and education because the nature of social contract. But today, with nation state, the social contract requires that state, in return to our citizenship as well as the tax, to provide health, education, and other social services. Uh, and then we are saying that no, we'll solve the problem with Bakhman Zekat. To the extent that I have seen research in Malaysia, for instance, suggested that how we can use what asset to pay off government's deficit to that extent. And, and these are problematic areas because the social contract, the political economy of the story is missing. You know, we have this particular political economy. Uh, so in the service, when you take it, take everything on the surface, everything is very easy to do that. And then the last school of thought is the substantivist school. So substantivist schools will say that, look guys, you get behavior, okay, historical school, historical institutions are okay, but what is important and essential, what do you want to achieve? What's the good view? Okay, so let's go to the substance of the debate. What do you want to achieve? How do we define things? So that substantive schools will consider you know, it is not the whole idea that Islamic finance should not be moving capital one place to another. A is said to B is halal and etc. If it is not halal for me to shop able to bring and etc. No, it is not the matter of using Islamic metaphor to justify capital transfer from one place to another. Let's go back what we want to achieve with that capital transfer. Okay? What is our whole objective with that? The Makassid, if you want, is very popular here as well. The Makassid discourse process, looking at the consequences, not only the process, but what consequences that we want to produce as a result. So that consequence will determine whether the action is acceptable or not, not only the process, whether it's setting to be, whether the process is allowed or not. So what is that consequence? Establishing justice and ikhsan. So justice, that's the essential element of what I will take.
And when that justice is not enough to deliver in the society, therefore, how we can explain to a son? A son here implies equilibrium, establishing equilibrium in the society so that so that the sustainability of the society is accessibility to resources can be ensured. And it is very much, uh, we are always reminded sort of about the rather prohibition of interest. One, no one tells us the last part of the universe. Secondly, no one tells us, for instance, sort of not 71. We will tell you that Allah favored some of you so that you can use those favors to establish what? Equilibrium and equity, sorry, and uh, establish equity in the society. Equity and equity establish in society. So that we can use those favors given to you to help the others to come to the level. The verse explained and tell that, and that's the ikhsan. So therefore, <clears throat> these are the sum of issues. I consider myself as part of the substantive school to look at the consequences and, um, and therefore establish them. But what is also important, the structure, okay? So therefore, why political economy is important for us and why moral economy is important for us, because it is not only my individual belief that I want to be good, but also the structure, the particular structure that we have in economy and society of facilitating that, okay? Because it is not only the behavioral norms, but the structures have to come. And therefore, um, as uh, Muhammad Bakr al-Sad will say that it is not only um, having a non rivalry banking and finance, but the entire structure is important for us to look into the, so that interactions, okay, interactions are important. Just to give you an example, um, and then there's this scholar, he looks at this uh, hybridity. The problem with hybridity, he will say that um, it will prevent you to search for authenticity. So you are in the comfort zone, so you do not need to look for authenticity. And it would say that, look, um, um, you want to establish the best car available for you. So in order to establish the form the best car for you to manufacture that, you might consider the best part of each car that is available around you, okay? Mercedes is famous for engine, X car is uh, famous for carburetor, and etc. So you bring all these parts, the best parts from all these different cars together to produce the most, um, most expensive, powerful car in the world. Because it is not the part. What's the issue is how those parts are linked to each other. In other words, the logics of it. So each car, each brand would have a different logic. So um, this, regardless of the best engine, best carburetors, and etc., bringing together, because each one have different operational system as a logic, they would not work. Okay. So that brings us, therefore, why we always go back to that question: whether Islamic finance is halal or not, whether it is Islamic, Islamic or not. Yes, because subconsciously, in a subaltern manner. We know that this institution, what is called bank, is not the authentic product of the Islamic emotions. Okay? So therefore, the connection, unfortunately, is not producing the consequences that we have. And therefore, uh, I get a bit nervous when some other people controls the, uh, oh, okay. controls the we don't have remote, I guess. Yeah? I know. Okay. Uh, you will yeah. have to. Okay. I'll be your remote. Okay, <laughs> no, because uh, just the shifting around that is here. But um, but that's the um, that's that's quotations from you know, some of you, most of you. I'm only here is the as the Sherlock Holmes Sherlock Holmes story and the disruption. So the conversation was between uh, this Scotland Yard detective and the guy from Holmes. Um, it says that this Gregory guy, the spoken guy that he said that is there any point to which you would wish to draw my attention? And the guy, I guess, is working for him, say, no, to the curious incident of the uh, of the dog in the nighttime. Uh, and uh, the spoken guy that they could ask, the dog did nothing in the nighttime? Because in the good old, good old days and everything happening, but the barking of the dog was important to alert you that there's something going on that you have to attend. 
And then the most will say that that must be a curious incident. The dog did not bark. Okay, the question is why Islamic finance is not working? <laughs> okay, disruption. Why disruption did not happen? Okay, so the barking should have happened by now. Okay, but it's not happened. Instead, uh, by not barking, it enables capitalism to move around. Okay. So that's the that's the problem that we have to consider why it is not happening, and it is also important to understand that um, we have to disrupt this. There is nothing wrong with that. They will tell you that no, no, you have to be good citizen. Good citizen only applies when the environment is good. So if it is not good, then we have to disrupt. Ali Shariati would say that I came to disrupt. Okay, so that's the important part. Is very much the uh, legacy that um, um, I look for. So we, we came to disrupt. And that, that was the emergence of Islam, disrupting the existence. And it is important when you look at the Islamic methodology. You will say, la ilaha. You would reject first. Okay? La. And then you will give the answer in that way. So we got the rejection, the disruption part, the Islamic type of cognitive knowledge system is important for us to understand. We have to reject in order to be able to. And therefore, humanity does not necessarily work for us um, to produce the outcomes. Based. However, having said that, I'm not suggesting that there is total purity historically available. No, uh, during the time of the Prophet as well, some of the practices that we have today as well uh, were prevailing before, such as Mudaraba, Mushaf, and Mudaraba, all that. And they were subjected to. Um, the Islamic moral norms to accept those practices. But one distinction with today, of course, today we are doing the same thing, but an important distinction. Who was the hegemonic power to decide that? It was the Quran, it was the Prophet who decided by using the Islamic norms to ensure that they are acceptable within the Islamic populace. And today, we have to squeeze into the global order. The global order tells us that, look, this is basic criteria. You're Islamic banks. You, know, you cannot do Musharraka, Mudaraba, equity financing because it doesn't fit into the risk management, and therefore you have to fit us. And therefore, Malaysia has to be the, uh, the land of organized power, despite the fact that Islamic Food Academy said that it's Haram. Okay? So you are ordered. That's the distinction. In other words, the hegemonic power determines. And, and therefore, in the history, when the blending was happening, you had empires, and of that power, if they were one way or the same level, when you look at societies historically. So there was an imposition, societies were borrowing. The Malays historically borrowed others, and others borrowed from Malays, but without any imposition. But now, since in particular beginning of the 20th century and later, since the 1970s with the Washington consensus, we are ordered to follow a part of the order, and then we have to fit into the existing, and in order to fit, we have to cut the excesses of um, Islamic world view for that. And therefore, that's the uh, important part of the story for us to consider. And I wish we had time um, to run this short part of this amazing uh, movie, as well as the biography. I don't know whether you guys have seen the Malcolm X movie or the biography. Uh, by Alex Halley. There's a particular particular section there. Uh, so uh, Malcolm X, before becoming a Malcolm X, um, he's in prison. And Nation of Islam guys, um, they were in prison. And they saw that this guy has some potential, so they, they appealed to him. And in order to convince him, this Nation of Islam guy um, takes Malcolm X to the uh, library to show him how the social constructions of meaning are constituted. He says, look, brother, he opens a dictionary in the library, okay? He says, look, let's look at the meaning of white, okay? They go through whatever you have in the world, the beautiful, the nice, everything, everything is white. The description, okay, how we describe reality. And then he says, let's look at life. Whatever the terrible things that you have in life, is expressed with blackness. Right? Now you will say that these are words, okay? So what's the wrong? No, these are socially constructed meanings. Okay? These are constructed. 
because you have particular position, you use the language to articulate that. Okay? So therefore, um, the meanings, you have to go beyond the surface of the meanings to understand the content. And therefore, you, you might be able to say, what's this wrong with economics and Islam together? No, it's not that simple, because there's a value system in that Islamic, and sorry, in that, in that economics, and there's a particular value system Islam has. So, Again, it comes to that here that in the entrance, the parts, different parts of cards. Because the value, the implications of economics, as we mentioned, definition of a particular human, and Islam defines human in another way. So, how we are going to bring together, and therefore the importance of the concept. Uh, the generation, of course, the founding fathers of 1960s, I have huge respect. They have led a light for us to the world, but of course the story is not finished yet. That's not the end of the history. That's only the beginning of history in modern times for us of the past. Okay? So therefore, um, these are the important ones. But before going further, please do interrupt me if you have any questions and comments to understand the issues that, that I'm referring to. So therefore, when you look at um, um, the conclusions, Confusions over concepts and their meanings, okay? And sustainability, such as it become a fast move, everyone is talking about sustainability, SDGs, and etc. Again, the real meaning of all this. What do we mean by sustainability, SDGs, ESGs, and all, the, all these different terms and terminologies that we have around us? What do they mean? And what what implications they have, <clears throat> they have for um, Islam? But also importantly for um, Islamic economics. So these are um, therefore important issues for us to consider, rather than taking everything on the same uh, face value, such as, such as when it emerged immediately, everyone talked about Islamic finance and SDGs without considering what constitutes SDGs, because there are issues that you will have real world view problems, but no one has considered about Islamic finance SDGs. And therefore, now we slow down on the sustainability and, uh, <clears throat> and, and the circular economy, and, uh, and therefore the importance of being critical, critical and critical, in order to be able to disrupt. Okay, um, so therefore, all these new terminologies are emerging, uh, but uh, uh, without developing this uh, critical thinking, uh, we will be just taken by the waves that is around us. But the objective is not to take it by the waves, but create waves. Okay? That distinction is important for us um, to look into. And therefore, today I'm going to share some of the issues with you. Although I have three slides here, but perhaps uh, in order to force you, uh, let's have some conversation. Do we have that part? Yeah. Okay. You might be able to share some. Um, therefore, um, critical discourses are essential for us um, to establish to understand the distinction. To understand that part of the critical distinction, um, the discussion, just a very quick and silly questions to, to understand the differences, okay? Um, I know uh, this is very silly, but I'm going to still again ask. Is five superior to four? Four is superior to five? Or five is equal to four? What would be your answer to this? Let's have a chat. <laughs> the first one, why? But why? <laughs> that one more than four. Okay, more than four. Anyone else? Let's justify our answers as well. Anyone else? Except you. Okay. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? Come on, guys. Let's have a discussion. I know it's very silly, it doesn't matter. Okay? That's very hmm? Sorry? I think it's clear. Oh, fine. So you, you feel the same? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? I think we need more information to decide. This is a very empirical answer to just like this is a very rational answer. Okay. What do you need for instance? Five what? Five what? What about five? Okay. Okay. Assumption. Okay. So the assumptions. Okay. Anyone else? What would, would that assumption be for instance? Go on. I think you need a proper unit. Yes. Okay. But grand. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's say one that you have a gram. Or, okay, or five fingers. So five kilograms would be more than four. Four, four grams. grams. Four grams. <laughs> Not okay. even four kilograms. Four kilograms. Okay, that's that's a response. Anyone else? Or maybe five apple, maybe more than four oranges. Some people like apples. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the taste and preferences. Okay. Oh, now. The taste is better than five. <laughs> oh, how the deck is better than five. Okay. So, depends whether you want more or you want less. Okay. Uh -huh. so, why, why would you ask for less? Four oh, hundred deck is a lot better than having five hundred Okay. I think, but, but why? It's a, it's a particular case, particular problem. It's something bad that happens, right? Experience. So, more of something bad is always not good. So um, the usual, the linear thinking that we have everywhere in the world nowadays, or not nowadays, since the Enlightenment, okay, for a few hundred years, would tell you that whatever the circumstances, whatever the assumptions, five is always superior. This is from the first class in the um, in the elementary school onward that we would learn, and therefore the entire assumptions we were referring based on that, okay. Uh, so optimization of portfolios, whatever you think, economic optimization, everything would consider that as the assumption. But that assumption of linearity misses something. The, the definitions, the values attached to that. Okay? So because the, this is the linear thinking is based on the enlightenment philosophy, which is based on God is dead. Okay, no values attached to that. And therefore, we have been taught all over the world that is the case. Now, simple, very simple example. You have a portfolio. You have money you want to invest. Okay, one portfolio gives you five return, five ringgit, whatever, five percent, whatever. But that would include riba. Okay, so there's a riba there, but there is one portfolio which gives you four. There is no riba, no riba. Now. Which one is superior for you? I, are you student? You answer for. <laughs> you are a student. You answer for. Okay. <laughs> so it is it's non non rebound because you have a particular value. Okay. Okay. Sometimes, of course, five may not have the rebound. Okay. So it works. As so you can see, it is the particular value, the definition that we put on those figures. That's important. Sometimes they might be equal, but it is not fixed. It is not linearity. It is not linearity. Okay. Um, so that's the important part. Why the values are attached. So um, nowadays we talk about sustainability. Your portfolio five might give you five, but it pollutes the environment. But four doesn't call it. Again, four is better for your expected to be. So why these are cases? It is because of the particular worldview. Okay. That's the starting point of constituting a theory. Okay? So if you start your theory, okay, five is always fair to four. Unfortunately, you won't be able to reach that authentic Islamic answer. Okay? So that's the starting point. So our Islamic economics, therefore, started with that assumption five is always fair to four. So we start the problems why economics is a term, is that because economics by term, Optimization will directly tell you that whatever the circumstances are, value is not there because five is always superior. Okay. So the next question I'll ask again. Rights privilege. Okay. So the question is whatever you have around you, is it a right or privilege? Anyone? I can finish the entire lecture with this, okay? <laughs> I don't need to go further because these are the essential. It sounds very simple, but these are the foundational issues. So, whatever you have around you is a right or privilege? It's related to your necessities, but perhaps it's more to your life. Get education, get education. Okay. And for 
village, it perhaps is more comprehensive. Where sometimes even you goes beyond right, like you, know, you are born as rich, right? So it's still privilege for the assets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? I think. Sir. I think. What we have around us is a privilege. Yeah? Because uh, it's a lot that we are having. Mm -hmm. so, and, uh, it's not our right to pay anything from our It's just a place of the world. Okay. Because of the world. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. In my opinion, um, <coughs> rights is well defined. Then you know what's your privilege. What that? So it's what starting point of the door. Yes, you need to define what rights belong to you. Okay. Anyone else, please? No, I think the legal system defines the privilege of the rights. The privilege of furniture law, your privilege with the employment, your privilege with the things. So, what law defined within that? What law defines? The natural law privilege. So you mentioned that the law will define the rights. How does it? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Come on, guys. Let's let's have a chat. Rights should be natural, right? Nice, nice human rights. Hmm. Rights should be natural or human rights. Okay. Yeah, privilege should be because of the condition we have in society. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. There's a cat. Yeah. Yeah. That's a privilege for us. <laughs> yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, that uh, why the privilege does it have to be competitive versus against another? It's it's complementary. Yeah. It's complementary because in in privilege you have right and right. Uh, among the rights, I think we should. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone? Yep. Yeah. Uh, whatever group that you have, might not be the right, the right thing is still not the right. Or mm -hmm. whatever rights you have, you supposed to have. Yes. So, it's like there are not, as my brother mentioned, there are contradicting parts of one. Okay. Okay, oh, yeah, that's good. And um, each one of them is, yes, what's the point as well? <laughs> Reminds us that the first part is important, I think. Um, each one of them represented part of the philosophy. Okay. So the Western Enlightenment based philosophy would say that everything that we have around you, it is your right, by definition. Okay, it is your right. And that, that is why, again, the definition of human, how you define it, maximizing individual, rational individual, and by definition, therefore, it has to be your right, what I mean. Right? So it is your right, by definition. However, the religious worldview, and it, including an important Islam, would consider everything around you as a privilege. And it's the the whole Khalifa understanding, whole Amana understanding, whatever you have around you is a privilege. The air, without air you cannot do anything. Your rights doesn't work when it comes to air, okay? It is Allah created and everything is for us already. Of course, we are not denying the right part. The right part is related to the use of it, okay? It is not the permanency. Because right would consider philosophically as prevalence. It is yours, it is your right, and we can do whatever to maximize. Okay? Maximize. In other words, we are moving from a utility theory based on the right. Right is based on utility, however, privilege based on the fala. Okay? It's two different functions, two different philosophies. And therefore, if you move it right, you will end up with what? Shareholder value maximization, okay, by definition, because it is your right, and therefore your companies, including your banks, including your Islamic banks, are all shareholders, okay. However, when it is privilege, 
And in particular, if it is within the Islamic philosophy, what we call is extended stakeholding. Okay? What does it mean, extended stakeholding? Everything that is created around us has to be part of that equation. Okay? So as you can see, definitions are important for us to understand how we are constituting theories. And that's, that's very much important to understand for us. Um, um, I'll, I'll shift quickly to another. No, no, you sit there. Uh, we'll shift to. Um, so we'll pass time as an issue. Uh, I'm comfortably meet the part. So it's a very long one. So therefore, um, it tells you when you establish all these definitions, what will happen, how your institutions will emerge, okay? What your institutions and how they can emerge. And that is an important question for us in which we have not gone through that theoretically to understand, okay? Um, as you can see um, on the screen, in order to have authentic emergence, authentic emergence, you would have the value system. In our case, would be the Islamic ontology, Islamic knowledge base. That would lead to the norms. Norms are the more practical aspects of values, okay? And then uh, the cognitive repertoire we have in the society. And they together will determine roles. Let's look at it. Then the institutions and theories, okay? So think about the emergence of Islam. The value system, Prophet Sallallahu is there. The value system is communicated, but not. But there were certain practices in the society, the cognitive repertoire in the society, including Mudarabha, Musharta, and all that. They were subjected to, as you can see, the line there, subjected to the norms of Islam, the ones that passed through accepted. And together they are established the roles. What do we mean by this? What is capital? What is labor? What is land? Who owns capital? For how long? Why? Who owns labor? Who owns land? Why? How long? And etc. All these debates okay, is determined. All these questions are determined. Therefore, the institutions, theories, and etc. are produced as a result of that process. Okay. So the result of that, of course. What we call is the emergence, okay? So you create a society, an economy, what we call embedded. What is it? Embedded into the value system that you have here. It is entirely embedded into the value system. As a result of that, what do we mean by, uh, by that? The essentialization of community, okay? The, essential <laughs> the essentialization of community there. Um, the mutuality, the, the fictitiousness, sorry. So what we are talking, as a result of that, entirely different sets, the mutuality, for instance, um, the, the importance of community, the importance of distribution, the, the justice, of course, essential part, the collective action, real economy, the commodification, commodification cannot be accepted, coordination and fictitiousness. There is no fictitiousness that can be accepted. So, so what do we mean by process? Okay, um, so uh, commodification. We are going through, such as in the UK, a huge problem, yeah. a huge problem with um, energy prices. Okay, energy has become we're worried about the online. Okay. <laughs> so what happens, um, okay, um, the, the energy issue. So uh, energy become has commodity. It is allocated to private companies. Private companies are um, producing. Like British, um, British petroleum makes billions. But people suffer currently in the UK to be able to pay their bills. But the important thing is, oil belongs to the society. Oil belongs to people. How come we can we allocate oil to a company 
to extract the oil and then make profit while it belongs to society. Okay? And remember again from Saul so I'm saying the two things should not be commodified. Okay? Air, uh, the fire, what was the water? Three things. Okay? These are essential. We cannot commodify them. They should not be bought and sold. It should be available for everyone to have access. Now, accessibility is an important issue for us to consider. Okay? So, therefore, the moral economy will suggest that. And therefore, the distinction, okay? So, when you look at moral economies, you start the story with good. You have a good, okay? And then you will sell that good through money. But in the end, you will have a different version of or increased good as a result, if it is a good business. However, in the market economy that we have, everything starts with money, okay? That is converted into, when you have money, it convert into what? Commodity. It's no longer goods, it's a commodity. Everything that we have around us commodity. And then it becomes more money as a result. And fictitiousness, commodification. However, within the moral economy, you wouldn't do that. And importantly, of course, why? Because there's an inherent value. Now, in order to understand political economy, you have to respond to three questions. What is your value theory? And what is your modes of production? And what is your distribution theory? Three questions as a system, in order to generate a system. Sometimes we use system as very basic or use Islamic financial system. No, there's a system. System three questions, okay? The political economic system. Your value theory, um, your modes of production, and your distribution theory. Now, in the value theory, in other words, this is a tank. Let's say that this is five million. How would you value this one? How have you ended up that this is five million? Any idea? Because in the current production method, you would look at what? how much capital you use to produce this one. The labor, yes, goes into that, but labor is defined in terms of capital cost as well. So capital returns, five billion, okay? So therefore, conventional economics would consider the exchange value and the use value. As long as it's useful, you can exchange it, and that's it. And then it becomes valuable, when you can exchange it. It's not considered inherent value. Whatever you have around you as a value, regardless whether it is exchanged, whether it is useful, because of what created. And therefore, when you establish the value of five limit here, have you considered, rather than just the capital implications, have you considered the, uh, the input through land, for instance, the implication for environment? In other words, all the stakeholders have to be considered in pricing, not only capital. That will be hegemonic capital, and that will be shit, that will be against um, hegemonic bomber. So you have to consider all the stakeholders that Allah created to establish the inherent value. So therefore, it is essentially important for us um, to understand the process of. So when we go to, for instance, banks, including Islamic banks, their production function but based on when they decide on the operation, like you guys are doing empirical research and some thinking, looking at the productivity and profitability. You look at data envelope analysis. You look at input and output. What is your input again? Is the capital and uh, labor, and the output is the efficiency. You establish the efficiency from it. But that will only consider capital and, um, and, and labor in a way. But what happens to other stakeholders in the process? Okay, and so it is missing. So therefore, the production function has to change. So when we talk about the reconsidering, these are the issues. Without changing the production function, we end up with the same institutional logic. Okay, so institutional logic remains the same. However, as long as you can see, five, four, privilege and right has a particular definition of what that institutional logic should be, because from the beginning, we have a different story. Them, to tell them. And therefore, and it is essentially important for us to, to consider because the definition when we look at, for instance, sorry, I, I lost the track of the presentations now. Okay, 
And therefore, when we look at how to constant the system, okay? So what you would have, the ontology. Ontology, the cognitive sources of knowledge, the source of knowledge. Enlightenment will tell you that human faculty is the source of knowledge only. Therefore, rational, maximizing individual activity. Okay? However, Islam will suggest something else. So ontology will determine the worldview, how we see world and how we look at it. For instance, within the uh, conventional understanding, the world, again, as long as it's maximizing, it is working for me. However, Islam suggests that no, the different definition of human. And human who is aiming at justice and, and ihsan. Okay? So therefore, um, that particularly I will determine for you the value system, the norms, the foundational principles to develop a theory. That will establish your social formation. What is social formation? It is how society is organized, including in terms of economics around resources. Who have access to resources? Why, how long, and etc. What is capital? What is labor? All those definitions, okay? Um, in other words, the governance of the society. That will produce the system for us, okay? That will be economic system, political system, social system, legal system, and etc. Each one of them will come together to establish a particular order. That's the Islamic order, for instance, or Christian order, and etc. Okay? So that will, therefore, brings us the Islamic order in our case, and through which we have to define what is modes of production. In other words, how we bring together those stakeholders, those resources together to constitute. Okay? That's a very important question, which I will um, tackle with you, inshallah, uh, and today. And, and therefore, um, you will establish as a result of that, because when you organize, when you suggest a particular governance system, you will establish the political structure, okay? The superstructure. And that will, of course, sorry, that will lead to the emergence of, of course, historically, when we look at, therefore, different um, civilizations in emerge, including Islamic civilization, with that understanding. Uh, and importantly, therefore, in order to constitute a system for us, we have to respond to those questions, what is, who is our value theory, our modes of production, and our uh, distribution theory. So these are important components for us to consider. Uh, without boring you further, um, if I go, therefore, it comes to your definitions, okay? So in the definitions, when you look at instead of economics, if you use it, the sub. Now, you could say that, no, um, the economics, when, when you translate it, the sub applies to economics. No. As the Malcolm X case, when you look at the words, originals, when it applies, they tell you different things. Economics, as we established, directly refers to something, however, it is said something else. Um, I'm not an Arabic expert, I have to learn it from others, but here I can see there are some Arabic speakers. They work like the sub cost and test. Okay? So, cost directing towards an objective. True path in line with an aim, equal and temporary. Test just share and justice. You see the world view, the way it defines the world. And Tali, you end up with something. Therefore, giving the right of everything to locate everything in its place and establishing justice. So, when you define Iqtasad as the essentialization, establishment of justice, when you define economics, it is maximization and rational. So you see the difference and directly emerges there. So therefore, when you look at the definitions of Islamic economics since 1960s, it's either establishing justice or preventing injustice. Okay? Look at all the whether Chopra, whether Siddiqui, Koshid Ahmed, um, Hassan Zaman, and all these definitions, when you look at, you will end up. Because, and that established the difference for us. Okay? So here um, in the economics, the word comes from oiko, home, and nomian, norms. And it is based on observation, everyday observation, okay? It looks at the um, relationships in terms of what happens in everyday practice, the home economy, in other words, norms related to home. And therefore, 
methodological rational, it cannot be rational because at least forget anything else, it will tell you that we cannot use river. Okay, immediately you move into what we call bounded rationality. So you are bounded with norms comes from somewhere else, not the practice, the entire difference. Self-maximizing, utility, profit, whatever it is. Efficiency, shareholder maximization, accumulation, and part of the utility. However, here, you have to give the right of everything. You have to establish justice. So therefore, two different definitions. Why? Because it, it comes from the knowledge source. Here, we have the Islamic knowledge based on privilege understanding. Therefore, you cannot maximize. If I maximize my, that will be against you. That will be against environment. And that is what is happening, what has been happening over the centuries. Because everyone wants to maximize. I always give this example. Until the Enlightenment, uh, when we look at, for instance, uh, Christianity, when it was prevailing in the West, again, the constrained domain. So people were not free to do whatever they wanted. Of course, in the in the Muslim world as well as in the Christian world, we had slaves, but that wasn't an institutionalized um, institutionalized um, uh, consequence. When constraints removed, when church constraints removed, when it comes to the maximization, it is your right what to do you can. The entire continent were made slaves. You see the distinction, okay? Because you are removing the boundaries, constraints, constraints from boundaries, behavioral norms. And that's the distinction between the two. So if I use economics, even together with Islam, because of the implications, because that video like um, Malcolm X, because of the implication, we have two different things. Hardware church and engine does not work together because they are from different ontological and therefore, authenticity important and integrity important. When we refer to integrity, the knowledge base and the outcome, as in the in the shape, your value system, norms, cognitive repertoire, has to determine the roles, okay? So that we can have consistency, integrity. Integrity with the knowledge base practice has to be the integral part of it. Of course, this has been challenged when we look at even the behavioral norms. We talk a lot about the Islamic norms and the importance of it, but unfortunately, Muslim societies are not necessarily masters of the corruptions and all those in, in the region as well as the societal level happens. But therefore, the integrity is important for us. The theory making integrity, the practice, contemplation, and action. And therefore, therefore, the importance of importance of the narrative here for us. And then, yeah, please, please. Yeah, go on. You know, it recognizes scarcity of resources, and therefore a choice making is the subject matter of economics. So how if we start to look at scarcity and what will be the subject matter of economics? Islamic moral economy does not accept scarcity. Scarcity happens with the accessibility the boundaries that is created for accessibility. Otherwise, the resources are available. Conventional Islamic doesn't matter, okay? A city is part of the economics of maximization. And Islam does not consider, therefore, scarcity. Scarcity in Islam is only one accessibility to operation, okay? Such as oil. In order to bring the oil um, to the, um, to the, from the ground, you need to have operational capital to be able to bring it to useful. The availability of resource to do that could be scarcity, but not the resource itself. Okay? So can you say that it's hmm? But that relativity is important, therefore I'm using the term operational and accessibility. Okay? Such as the example here. Okay? So I'm just shifting between things so I didn't follow the equation. So this is what you have. Football is not the best example, to be honest, I hate football, uh, but this was the best thing I could find in the social media to express what I want to say. You see, there's a barrier. There's a resource there. Again, football is not resource, but there's a resource there. There's a barrier here. And not only that, you have the Amazon owners and the Microsoft owners here, dominating entirely, okay? And this guy doesn't have any access with it, all this perhaps jobs. 
establishing equality doesn't solve the problem, okay? Because the guy is already up there, okay? And therefore, justice. Okay. So justice with the price, we have to provide accessibility. Because here, scarcity, there is a resource, but this guy has taken everything, okay? Prevents the accessibility. However, when we move to justice, um, and therefore you provide accessibility. Sorry, Nizam, if I describe for you, uh, think about a football stadium, and you have uh, a barrier that you cannot see beyond. And uh, a guy, um, he could put up all the dollars together, put on top of it, and can see everything. But the other two guys cannot see because their height is not enough to see beyond the border, okay, the barrier. So if you do equality, if you distribute this first guy, the tall guy uh, who has the capital, even if you distribute that equality, would not allow you still the, 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 the smallest guy to be able to see because there is a barrier there. So in order to establish, uh, overcome the problem of accessibility and hence capacity, we have to look at the need, okay? So the, the, the smallest guy has to receive the largest uh, distribution so that he can or she can see what is happening beyond the barrier to be able to access the resource. Um, so therefore, as you can see, scarcity here, this guy cannot have it. It's not because the resource is not available. The resource is there, but the barrier created, okay? And therefore, if you uh, look at even in this one, as you can see, some of us even in the negative, kind of the negative, with the financial system that we have today, okay? And therefore, it doesn't solve the problem. So if you from here, therefore, as you can see here, there is a correction mechanism. Rather than distributing the resources to establish equity, what we are saying, and this is the Islamic economic position, saying that, like, yes, the social security is important, of course, has to have. But we have to ask, there's this amazing, amazing question. The question, um, um, the, the, the uh, uh, Tradition, uh, Catholic, Catholic salvation theory would tell you that yes, it is important we support the proof, okay? But we have to ask the important question: Why proof is proof? Okay, so that directly brings the political economic issue to accessibility of resources. Why proof is proof? We never ask. Of course, zakat is. We have to give solidarity is important because that's the definition of human within Islam. We have to be concerned with what is happening around us. But at the same time, we have to ask the question, why food is food? Because that comes to this, that comes to the barriers. Who has the right to put the barriers? Why Allah gave all these resources to everyone to have accessibility, but someone is putting a barrier? Oil is not acceptable, accessible for people, so that the oil companies can make billions of dollars of profit why Allah created oil for everyone okay so therefore as you can see in this in this uh, picture uh, this is um, the barrier is still there but the barrier is created in such a way it is not like a fence but it is visible so it still prevents you to move on but at least you can see the football for instance in this example okay uh, so there is an accessibility yes to argue for a stakeholder model. Extended stakeholder, yeah. So how are we moving from a shareholder model to a stakeholder model? Uh, uh, Sometimes the stakeholder model. Let me ask the question why poor is poor. Uh, yeah. When we ask the question why poor is poor, when we ask that question, okay. So because with that, a new social contract, okay. In other words, what you have currently is the entire domination. Corporations, okay? Corporations dominate the resources. There are good examples within the convention. Norway is an oil-rich country. Norway tax oil companies by what? 78%. Why? Because the prime minister of Norway, when introduced the tax 78%, said that oil belongs to society. And therefore, Norway is one of the best, what, welfare state, okay? No, I'm talking about the Islamic solution. I, no, I don't agree. No, I'm talking about accessibility to resources 
and his lungs are just accessible to the resources. Whether for you it, it sounds socialism, that's your take up, but that's not my position. Uh, because socialism has different uh, ways of uh, organizing society. Islam has a different ways of organizing society. And I'll, I'll come to show you that the difference. Yeah? So, but the resource access, so that's important because Allah created the resources for everyone to have access to. Uh, for instance, uh, I think Mutahari uh, or Talabani would say that, what is jihad? Of course, you will say jihad for that, for, the, for this. Jihad, he said, for Fisabilillah. He says, what is Fisabilillah? It's for Mecca, for Kudus, for what it is. It is says that jihad is very much related with this issue that we are discussing, Allah created all the resources for everyone to have access. So removal of the barriers from allowing people um, to enable people to have access, that is jihad. In other words, establishing the society of justice. That's the essential part for us, to remove the corporations. And therefore, the best solution in the end, the, the best prophetic solution, it will be this one. In the end, and kindly removing the barriers. In this one, uh, Islam, the barrier is entirely removed, even yeah. visible barriers uh, were removed, mm -hmm. um, so people have what we call the liberation, and therefore the liberation. Okay? In other words, removing the need, the resources are there, removing the needs, liberating the people, because needs create dependence, and Allah does not accept dependence. Why that is discouraged in Islam? Despite the fact that I know in, in Malaysia, Certain scholars talk about it, that is an essential part of Islam, Islamic finance. No, that is ter terribly discouraged in Islam because it creates dependence. You have a dependence hierarchy and relationship with the institution with, from the people that you borrow. And Allah does not accept it. There's no shirk in Islam, no other hegemony. So that distinction is important, therefore, for us to understand. So that brings, therefore, the importance of how we constitute. Okay. Yep, please. I really love the liberation thing. Can mm -hmm. I do that? Yep. But my question is, we have this liberation model for uh, the lowest league available, lowest league of football or whatever game. It's there. Everyone can watch it. But what about Messi? Who can watch Messi? Because you only look at the one watching. But what about who pays for the players? Who pays for the players? Yes, who pays? No, I'm asking you because you are calling for liberation. Yes, we can have no boundary whatsoever to the stadium. But who's playing that is what I said. People pay for who is playing. No. So now the question is yeah. you want to watch the lowest league or you want to watch the best players? Why do you want to make this distinction between the two? Because this is what you're showing. The model that you're showing there is clear that now you are watching football game. Yep. Okay? Yep. But the players are actually on different levels. Why, why they are different levels? <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, why different okay. levels? Because of the talents that they have and the skills that they have acquired. No, I'm sure that in the streets down there, there are people with the same quality and skills. What makes them different? How sure are you? On modification. No, the question now is, how sure are you? Are you 100% sure? Tell me, you're saying there's messy out there? Yep, there are plenty. Of, I agree. Plenty of messy. But? Plenty of. The difference is that there is no capital behind that person. There, there is no capital behind that person. No one has capitalized that guy on the street because there is a capital behind that guy. Okay. okay. So Fine. the person has been commodified. Okay. Football has become a commodity. Okay. okay. Football is supposed to be an enjoyment for us to come together on the green to play around. But it's a commodity. And Ooh. commodity in Islam is haram. No, yeah, okay. We have to have somebody like Beckham who sees, okay, I have my seat, I have this, I have. We have to come together and create a team that is very nice to watch. Then you have Jude Bellingham and so on. So. Fine, you call it capitalism, you call it commodification. But in the end, you are still enjoying the fruits of capitalism. No. Okay. Because you are not football lover. <laughs> I'm sure those who are lovers here are actually enjoying Messi being play play with uh, Mbappe or whatever. That combination yeah. of resources and technical uh, of players is what makes the communication itself. Because one thing you are missing, 
capitalism survives by creating demand. So it is not demand. It is not creating day, demand. The demand is already there. Happen. People day, want to the watch the best of players combine to assemble a team. People want. That's what but people assemble think. team to make profit. It's yeah. a commodity. So do you understand the meaning of commodity? Yep. So the football becomes a commodity because I am a guy who wants to make billions of okay. money. I bring people together and I establish all these brands and etc. because I think that I can commodify on this. I can be crazy, even be produce another crazy game and put a lot of money behind it. Okay? Yes, yes. So football, such as the example we are talking, is not innocent. But it will not it work unless and until people pay. It will not work yeah, unless people, and until pay, people pay. Because you so are, that means you are not creating demand for useless reasons. There must be real bite to whatever demand okay, you are trying to make. I'm suggesting that this uh, innocent description of first year economics that um, you know the consumers are the dominant prevailing. No, even in the first year economics would tell you that every supply creates the demand. Okay, Ooh. the causality, the causality. So it is, it is the way capitalism no, survives. No, no. Demand uh, is there when people. We demand no, have innovation, the, innovation, the economy, innovation, so innovation is the eye of the entrepreneur seeing that there's market to be yes. addressed. Yes, innovation. So is that defying uh, first year economics? I mean, uh, let me ask you this question. For you, is it justifiable to commodi commodify everything that we have ever, ever around us? I like for instance, everything for instance, because that's the key word No, no, it doesn't matter. For instance, so I have I to can, disagree with you. I, can, I have to agree no, with no, no, you because you use the word everything. No, no, therefore everything, yes. So yes. let's say that I, 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 bring, you, I bring the best um, uh, medical doctors all over the world and I establish a market. I go to poor countries, butcher people, get their kidneys and bring here and I, I say, look, I'm, I'm delivering goodness here. Yes. I like, I, 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 actually, I like I your framing yes. because now you and use I, emotional, emotional, emotional views. views. Yeah, yes, now, now I'm, I'm, no, yeah, now I'm ethical. putting, <laughs> it's true. Now I'm putting a different thing. Actually, by the way, I have to explain myself. Nadia, let me explain. Let, let, let me explain. Let me explain. <laughs> let me explain. Actually, I'm like this because I have gastric issues. I'm actually shivering because I didn't take proper a big fight, actually. That's why. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, those who know me knows me. Yes, yeah. Insulin, sure. Actually, I'm like this. I'm shivering because. It's okay, I'm an insulin. But I asked you a question. I forgot to bring my insulin, a particular insulin. I looked at the price here. How much it is, you know? 200 pounds. 860 something ringgit. Is it justifiable? Why? Because, because you're here, you actually have to buy it. A particular, a particular company, it's only one company produces it around the world as a domination and monopoly. But how, can I come back to your point just now about the commodity. example that you use? Yeah. The the no, actually, I can put a different picture. Sure. Let me ask all of us here. Didn't you watch more of Anasal Anasal games, Saudi League, because of these players coming? Tell me the truth. You watch it more or not? It's quite profitable. I never I think not, no, 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 I know, no, but I'm not talking. Okay. This is about maybe by accident, maybe few seconds that can, but I would like to watch that. <laughs> Dr. Nahar, I, I think you're you making. Have to, when I bring yeah. reality yeah. to perspective, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think Dr. Nahar. Okay, I'll, I'll pick up from there. When I started, when I started, I refer to four schools. One of them is a realistic school. So that's your position, I respect it, but I don't accept. Okay, because realistic school is what has brought us here. We have become all slaves of the existing system. Okay, so therefore I reject the realist school. I'm not a realist. As I mentioned, I'm a substantive school. Realist school will always impose that this is the only reality you have. No, this is not the reality we have. We have the, and therefore a very young girl, 15 years, a 16 year old girl, went around the world said that, look, we have a climate problem. But with realistic school, like the Trump like people who say that what is climate problem? Now there is a climate problem, and that 15 years old girl came out on the streets to mobilize people saying that there is a climate problem. But realistic school will not accept that. So 
So therefore, the distinctions, methodological distinctions are important for us to understand. Yes, people watch, right? Because people have been grafted. We have a particular terms to explain the grafting process. So capitalism grafts us, each one of us. Why people, despite the fact that they have iPhone in their pockets, they go to queue to get the new iPhone. Because we are grafted. It is not because you need that iPhone. You have one in your pocket, but we go to get another one. Because capitalism tells you it's a dependence that is created. But so oh, that's an important. Let's take a simple uh, example. Uh, let's say that two kind of play uh, mesh. Which one is from high school players? They are free. We are not to watch. We are no one is learning between Barcelona and Real Madrid. And we have to pay, let's say, 100 ringgit for us. So, but my question goes back to the foundation. Why do we have a commercial league? I mean, yeah, that's the question. Why do we have commercial league? Uh, no, that, 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 it's not a salary. You know how those, how much they get? It's not a salary. It, what money they get, it does not relate to the effort. Okay. Effort, whatever the money that you expect from your community has to relate to that. Because whatever you get, it's not a lot. Yes, to later. Yeah, if I may interject, I think another important thing is why are we willing to pay so much to watch a football game when there's so many people starving elsewhere? So I think it's also the value we're assigning to each day. Yeah. So, yeah. So you were saying? I have uh, two short questions. The first one, I know your assumption about the uh, economy in your moral Islamic moral economy mm -hmm. one. and number two it seems that you have the idea about the function and role of market and exchange yes from the discussion yeah, that's so what it is explain this to you. okay that's very good I was coming to that thank you yeah that makes a difference for us to understand the distinction okay and therefore um, uh, just uh, and therefore I refer to important concept uh, one is your value to you so you don't have exchange value or use value, you have inherent value. So that dialect, it has the nature of market. Okay. I will explain that. Then the modes of production, how you bring resources together. And the third one is the distribution. Okay, I'll come to that. So therefore, the whole Islamic world, political economy, the justice based on Adala and Iksan, entirely based on Mizan, the balance, and how to um, how to sustain that balance because that again requires the relationship between stakeholders. It has to be based on a mizan, the balanced order that Allah created. So if I maximize mine, that can be ex at the expense of yours and the environment and etc. And therefore the mizan will be ex um, affected. And it is imperative therefore on us to correct if there is any failure in the system uh, to produce that outcome. Okay. I'll just uh, how much we have. I'll just quickly go through and explain the market because that's important and the three questions. Okay. So therefore, um, Islamic moral economy as a result uh, is based on entirely different cognitive base, the sources of knowledge, Islam, the Quran, okay, revealed knowledge, and therefore tafid. Now, what is important with tafid, therefore, to understand what I'm saying, tafid, of course, when we define is the oneness of Allah. Um, and all these definitions, but what is important, complementarity or unitarity? What do we mean? In other words, therefore, the whole why utility theory doesn't work, why maximization doesn't work. I complement you, you complement him, we complement each other, we complement the environment and other stakeholders, the complementarity. So therefore, my, my, my well-being is directly related to you, to environment and etc. And this was very obvious during COVID. During COVID, if you wanted to remain healthy, you had to make sure that the other people are healthy and free of COVID. Because as long as other people around you have COVID, you will lose as well. You see how it is interlinked, the, the complementarity. So Tawheed suggests complementarity in terms of accessibility to resources. So it's not a maximization mine, but it is ours, together with other um, stakeholders that we have around us. 
And that comes to the Adalai justice, justice and ihsan, Adalai and ihsan. In other words, the distribution as a result of the complementarity, the resource accessibility will be, of course, based on justice. But when there's not enough, um, directly ihsan will suggest that those who are in better position have the others to bring to the similar level. Surah al 71, particularly directly tells you what it is. And then when you come to Kaskia part, that will tell you that, look, because it's complementarity, because to establish justice, by definition of that, our growth is linked to each other. My growth cannot be at the expense of you. Our growth cannot be at the expense of environment, climate, land, and etc. and society. So it is the complementarity. Why? Our growth has to be in harmony. And sometimes, therefore, Rather than growth, perhaps it has to be the growth. Okay? Because my growth need, if it runs against your growth, then I have to do the growth. Okay? Then that's important. Why? Because again, Rubavia tells us that Allah created everything and everyone we have around us with a particular path to develop according to the Fitra for perfection, to reach perfection. Okay? The perfection to achieve that. And therefore, uh, we have to provide the necessary portion space for everyone and everything to develop that. Okay? And therefore, the importance of Amana, because whatever we have around us is Amana. And it is the Khalifa, being the vice of Allah on the earth, gives us the responsibility to achieve. And therefore, um, when we look at the whole constitution of um, um, Islamic moral political economy, as we mentioned, so Islamic order. Okay, what Islamic order tells us to Islamic ontology, as we mentioned, Tawheed. Tawheed, as we mentioned, is the unitarity and complementarity. That leads to a particular worldview. What is your worldview? As we have established, because worldview enables us, okay, um, to see the world and locate the human, how we see the world and how we locate the human within that. And Islamic world, we, as we mentioned, life is privilege, okay? And fala for human and ihsan for society so that the equilibrium, the mizan can be sustained. That brings us social formation, the, the governance of society, how resources are distributed in the society, how we have access to resources, okay? It is embedded. It is embedded in the Islamic uh, and morality. And that's the distinction between market system as we have and the Islamic market. So Islamic market therefore has to be embedded. It is not the market that determines, it is the value system that determines. It is not the supply that creates the demand, it is directly the priorities of society. And therefore there's a distinction between market as a system that we have today imposes on us everything, how it operates, and market as a place of exchange. So these are two different things. Place of exchange or is a system. And, and therefore, Polanyi, for instance, in the Great Transformation will say that when the market started emerging as a system, it was the whole morality collapsed in the, in the process, okay? And therefore, um, I, I missed to show you that, Border will say that it is not the price that determine everything, it is the everything that determines price. So that's important for us. It is not the price that determines everything, but everything else, the value system of society that determines price. Okay? So because if you go with that, typical um, market system economy, then you won't have access to education, you won't have access to health and etc. because you have to pay, pay and etc. But it is everything else that determines price. In other words, the needs in the society, people's need, people's accessibilities, and etc. has to be. And therefore, I have to remind as well, um, a number of colleagues refers to Intaimia's definition to justify the market system. Intaimia states that the price established in the market is the price of all. That's correct. But Intaimia said. But the market that Intaimia was referring. It's not the market system. It is the place of exchange where justice prevails. So that distinction, but unfortunately, quite a number of colleagues are using out of the context to justify capitalist market system. 
That's not the acceptable. So the nature of market that in Kenya was different. Because remember that in Kenya at the same time, um, constituted the theory of HISPA to regulate the market when there are excesses. Okay? These are important points. And therefore, that brings us to system. And the system, social system, political system, legal system, economic system. But what is in the economics and how these are linked? These are linked, of course, with the Islamic knowledge base, the ethical system. And therefore, within the Islamic economic system, the modes of production value theory and distribution theory has to be. And therefore, this ontological construct that we have, okay, but then you might be able to say that, look, this is very hypothetical because Muslim economy is different, Malaysian economy is different than Saudi, Saudi is different than Morocco, and etc. Yes, that's correct. The principles will remain the same, okay? But there will be differences in the field. In other words, how the society is, the available capital is different. In Saudi Arabia, you would have oil, but in Malaysia, you would have partial different resources. Habitus, the behaviors are different, behaviors of people. Okay, so therefore, when it comes to the horizontal construction, the field, capital, and habitus have to fit into this ontological construct that we have just gone through. Uh, so differences is there, inevitable, uh, because the field, capital, and habit is different from one source to another, but the principles have to be there. Of course, currently, the problem we are, we are going through, Islam is a universal view, but we are living in nation states. Nation states are constructed entirely with the modernistic understanding, which is based on Allah is dead. Okay, that is dead. So how we are going to deal with that? That's the current challenges that we are going to in every aspect of life, including Islamic banking and finance. Islamic banking and finance, for instance, they have to uh, obey basal criteria. Okay, it sounds very uh, normal, very normal procedure, and very innocent. No, uh, when the bank negara tells Islamic banks that we have to follow basal criteria, that implies that Islamic banks will not be able to do any equity financing because that will run down the entire risk uh, management process. Okay? So what you call grafting, the existing system grafts you. All these excesses you have, it says that look, you have to fit into it. Okay, Unlike, otherwise I will. So therefore, the universal versus the uh, particular, that has been the main challenge. And therefore, in the process, Islamic finance has to give up all these values attached to it, how to make a difference in the society contribute to everyone's life, but it has become a capital moment story, as in the conventional case with the Sharia compliance. So therefore, that, that, that this particular issue is important for us uh, to consider and to understand in the process. Um, and, and therefore, um, when you look at, for instance, what is riba? Um, and here, two important um, uh, important part of the Islamic world conflict. Of course, riba is prohibited, everyone knows. But riba is not prohibited to create in, um, to create the instruments to go around it to facilitate capital movements. And that's the important part of the story definition. Riba direct riba prohibition directly relates what capital is. Rather than facilitating the capital woman, it aimed at entirely decentering capital so that the, the difference between stakeholders' capital should not have the hegemony like in those pictures, but should be in the similar levels with other stakeholders, because finance is only an intermediary. It cannot be source of value creation, value creation in itself. And therefore, the whole object is to descend their capital remove the power of capital to bring to the same level with others, okay? And just opposite to that, you have zakat. So zakat, everyone, um, everyone talks about it now. But what's the implication of zakat within this stories that we are narrated, that we are discussing? It is, again, is Allah created all those resources for everyone to have access. When, with the privatization, when accessibility is prevented, the compensation has to take place. So people's accessibility prevented through the 
uh, privatization and therefore compensation has to take place. And expropriation, revised prohibited because expropriation using the power of capital and second expropriation happens because of the privatization, therefore the society has to be compensated for. So therefore, as you can see, an important part of the story, time is an issue. I'll finish just uh, responding to some of the questions. Okay. So the, the issues that we have been uh, suggesting, one of them is importantly, of course, is the capital accumulation. Okay, capital accumulation is not the objective in some. Capital, finance, everything is just intermediary to reach to the whole objective of justice in the, in the society within the political economy. And therefore, unfortunately, the Muslim world and Islamic economists, the theoreticians and the practitioners and finance, we have been squeezed to this question by Weber. Weber said that Muslims cannot accumulate capital and therefore cannot generate capitalism. That's a very fair response to be honest. But Muslims got very much offended with that. How come Islam cannot do that? Because they understood the question in a wrong way. They understood that Islam as if Weber stated that Islam cannot deliver development. No, capitalist development. It was that capitalist, everyone missed that. They got very offended. No, no, we can be the best. And therefore, to their rescue came another person called Rodinson. Said, oh, I went through the entire Quran and the tradition of the Prophet. These are the best capitalists. And Muslims immediately jumped on that wagon. Unfortunately, said, oh, we can produce. Them. So these are the wrong arguments. What Weber was saying that Catholic, therefore Jomo's paper responding to um, uh, Weber's position is very important. I would suggest that those of you who haven't read it, Jomo's paper, because he understood properly. Uh, but of course, no one listened to it. That's another story. <laughs> okay? So it wasn't the capital accumulation. Okay? I say capitalist, uh, sorry, it was the capitalist accumulation leading to capitalist development. So capitalist, capital accumulation in Islam cannot. Of course, Murat Chizakcha came out and wrote the book Islam Capitalism. These are again two different, like Islamic economics, as we explained, capitalism suggests something, a different worldview. Islam suggests that. No. We can, of course, say that in Muslim societies, capital accumulation took place. But having capital accumulation does not justify capitalism. During the time of the Prophet, there were very rich people, Sahabi. But the whole objective was how they could contribute to the betterment of other people. Okay, they accumulated capital, but used that capital. The objective wasn't the accumulation of capital. But capitalism directly based on corporate identity. What Timur Quran would criticize us, they would say that Western world could not develop because they couldn't create corporations. Because Timur Quran misses an important part, a different ontological base. The Muslims were not stupid, idiots. No, their social formation would not allow to accumulate capital. And from because that will create an entirely different social formation as opposed to Islam. Okay? So that's that's important for us to understand. Corporations cannot be therefore embedded institution. And, and especially, I'm sure that there are few people here to understand food better than my understanding. Even in Islamic law, there is no third person. It has to be a real person. Okay, yes? But then the question is, how come we have corporations with the Sharia board who gives fatwa every day for an institution that they do not recognize? Okay? That's an important point for us to, to discuss, okay? Because I raised this issue, I state that Islamic banks, they have to give zakat from their profit. And the Sharia scholars immediately reminded me that, no, they cannot, because they are not real entity. They are not accepted. Then my question was that, if they are not real entity, how come they would be able to give fatwa every day to justify their operations? So an institution that does not exist Yet it exists. You see the difficulty? Because corporations, Islamically, as an entity in itself, is not acceptable within the Islamic social formation. And therefore, Timur Prahman said that the capital did not accumulate because we have, Islam has this amazingly um, um, egalitarian um, inheritance system. Or we don't have corporations, 
because when we have Mudarga Moksha, when the project finished, that's it, the relationship will have. So these are therefore no important issues, the capital information. The second one is uh, the market. So Medina market is important for us to consider, okay? If we are creating new imaginations. So Medina market, when Professor Salam moved to Medina, there were two markets already there, okay? Run by non-Muslims. And Professor Salam, however, created the third one, the Islamic market, if you call it. The objective was not exclude the non-Muslims from that market, no. Non-Muslims operated in that market. But the objective was not to subject the Muslims to the rules of others, the hegemonic relationship, okay? So they have their hegemony, Islam would have its own hegemony to determine rules and regulation of how that market prevails, not based on to determine whether I can do Musharraq or Mutarraq, okay? So that distinction is, so market was a place of exchange, the establishment of justice, Okay, the substance, and therefore the Madina market is an important experiment for us to look into to understand the nature of market. Now that comes to your question on this source, whether I'm suggesting that sources. No, it's not. Uh, those of you who have been uh, who have taken our teaching um, economic classes, you will know that of Douglas production functions solo growth model. Okay, that's your modes of production. So your modes of production, capitalist modes of production, K and L. K will get alpha, L will get one minus alpha, and nowadays we have technology with A there, okay? But as you can see, even labor, L, is determined by K, capital. Capital equivalence of labor. Socialism, however, of course, will not accept K because that will be communal, but what it will say, uh, labor is the uh, is the value theory is determined by labor. In other words, whatever you produce is the product of labor in the end, okay? Uh, K is common. Now look at this, let me put one. The story, um, I didn't put the detail here, capital will come in the second equation, not in the first. That is a summary here I'm presenting, it's very detailed. So one, there is no labor, because labor is the commodified form of human. Human cannot be commodified, okay? Yeah, that's important. Because human effort that for this year. We cannot commodify. Then land, land and environment, society, capital, and other stakeholders. Other stakeholders will determine, as we discussed, field, okay? Habitus and capital, depending on what society has. And what is important here, as we mentioned, in the capitalist production function, whether solo growth, uh, whether Cobb Douglas, L will be determined by K. In other words, L even is not independent, the capital value. The Islamic one, as you can see, human effort will have alpha, land environment will have beta. Each one of them got the production as independent, not determined by the other. Um, Society will have a different square creek, okay? And then, if that is not enough, in order for each of the stakeholders to reach to their perfection, the Rubavia within Caspia, in order to establish justice, as you can see, in front of each uh, factors uh, stakeholder here, we have a coefficient. And that is the distribution from Beta Mal, from Zakat, okay? Um, for those who deserve, who are qualified to get that so that everyone can have a dignified life. So therefore, as you can see, when you compare the production functions here, no, socialism cannot even reach to this idea. Okay? It is much extended and independence, creating the independence for each stakeholders in the process. Okay? So one more concept and I'll finish. Okay. The Fala function, okay, utility in other words. It is because if we are talking this equation here, we cannot have utility maximization anymore. It is not the utility, it's the Fala function. So what do we mean by Fala function? Is the individual A, his or her production, consumption, and giving. Fala of others and other stakeholders in the society, and importantly, the repercussions in the hereafter, the outcomes, the impact in the hereafter, Subject to what? Exact. However, in the conventional, your utility, your consumption, 
subject to your budget. So you see the differences here and there. Of course, realistic people will not accept that, but the difference, we have to make a difference. If you want to make a difference, we have to change our imaginations. And therefore, that's important very much for us to consider. Um, there are other areas, but I think I'll stop with that. And therefore, um, just to conclude, um, it is what is important for us is uh, rather than having this uh, a frozen view um, um, and just uh, um, accepting the reality as it is, whether Islamic or not, we have to provide uh, we have to provide responses right? because the current effects, the way the resource accessibility is organized, is not accessible. Acceptable. What we have seen, for instance, COVID liquidity from the governments. When you look at where did they go? Stock market. And in the stock market, you have companies which are not operating, which were not operating, yet their values were increasing in the stock market. Okay? So it is entire fictitiousness, entire commodification that has been imposed on us. As Oscar Wilde will say that, they know the price of everything, but value of nothing. So our objective is to bring that value to ensure that it is not the price that determines everything, but it is everything that determines price. And therefore, we have we have to get out this unfrozen um, into the uh, unfrozen imagination because I feel that somehow um, we started believing that we have reached to the end of history, but end of history is not yet there even. And therefore, um, we have to develop our imaginations. And the search and publications are important, but in the publications, of course, again, we are doing a lot of mimicry and we have forgotten the, uh, the whole theory. Without theory, um, Islamic finance will not work as it is expected. Therefore, our objective should be to constitute that theory, inshallah. And therefore, we have to move into saying something new to without, as Romain would say, how pleasant it is to flow without bullying and freezing. So we should not be uh, bullying or frozen, but we have to flow with clearness. Okay, and I'll leave you with that and how it was useful. And uh, uh, let's, let's continue debate uh, from here onward to other platforms as well. But what is important, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's not captivate it with what is around us, but let's go to that issue. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, think, I think um if the intention was to create waves that you were able to do so in this room <laughs> to a large effect. Certainly, uh, I think the way you started, you kind of gave us the bigger picture and tried to move towards um you know um an understanding of how an alternate reality can be. And I think that's something that's quite challenging because kind of breaking from what is the normal and, um, you know, trying to have a unique view of uh, value is uh, nothing less uh, challenging. So I think um, it was a very interesting uh, point um, and, and insights that you've given us. And I, I think our challenge is, you know, for, for our own is very clear what we have to do. Um, and uh, whereas you know, our markets are there and they are supposed to reflect what we value as important right there and they're supposed to be centers of justice. That basically means that markets are a function of human beings. But if the things that we value are wrong as human beings, then the market will only reflect those values. And so um, how do you break that deadlock, I think, is uh, something that we all need to reflect uh, on. So um, I, I think we, we still have a bit of time, maybe about 10 more minutes for questions. Uh, those of you um, who have jotted down something and um, hopefully Professor can um, respond to those. Thank you. Um, I, I saw that hand going up first, no. so maybe you can introduce yourself a short one. Uh, thank you so much, Bob. Assalamualaikum. Is it for me? From the price that you tell me the But sometimes in the market, we face some inconsistencies. Where the price may be higher than the value because of scarcity and monopoly. 
and it may be lower than the value because of competition and the forces of the Is there any factors? In terms of the value determining the price, not the value, not the price that determines the value in the market. But when I bring it to you, that sometimes the price may be higher than the value. Maybe it's too low for or scarce. So let's first thing establish what do you mean by value? What did you understand from that value that I was referring? Commodity and the market. No. The value I was referring is the normative values in the society. The solidarity of the process, being together, making people to have access to resources. So that's the value. Okay? It is not the commodity value. So therefore, when it comes to between the prices and the value, the values of the society have to determine the priorities. It is not the priority that I want to watch from other. It is a priority that I want to chill out with you, sitting in the grass and watching something. So that's the, therefore, the value system. The value system should determine the price, as it was in the good old days in the West as well. Um, okay, West, uh, I mean, uh, when you read, for instance, I would suggest everyone here to read Hawaii's um, Great Transformation, and you will see how in the West the modern economies have shifted by the imposition of market to the unregulated market, therefore, rather than values, such as reciprocity. Okay, I'll give you an example from. Turkey, I want to jump from Turkey, um, such as they are, our Turkish part is very much heavily agricultural. I'll give you an example. In the good old days, for instance, um, we would be helping each other to harvesting the land because we are in that community, we live together. Okay? Um, so even not reciprocity, just because we are in the same community. Then with the emergence, slowly emergence of the market, what happens? Um, I'll tell you that, uh, look, um, I'll come to you to, uh, to do the harvest together, but we have to come to my answer. So you establish conditions. So from moral economy, but the values, regardless whether you come to me or not, in the initial solution, because we are a part of the same community, we have to help each other. But then I turn that into what? Reciprocity. Then 1950s onward, in Turkey, the labor market very well established. Then it's what, what happened. I come to you, but this is my hourly wage. You see the distinction, how it changed. Okay? So now I have to charge you because there's a labor market, there's an opportunity cost of the market. Right? So the relationship, how the market changed the entire relationship. Okay? We were just helping each other, regardless whether you would come help me or not. It turned into reciprocity, but then when the full labor market is established, now I will charge you, this is my wage, daily wage. So the imposition of the market. So therefore, it removed the value system of the society being in the same community, that's the value system. So that now our relationship and the base of commodity. I have labored my commodity, I'm selling it to you, and you have to pay for that because there's an opportunity cost. So therefore, the changing nature of the market, the market becoming a market system rather than the place of exchange, create all this problem, therefore the price hike is taking. Now, because of the all economic problems you have, I'm not sure whether it is happening in Kuala Lumpur, but the rents are going crazy in major cities in the world. Okay, so now would you say that look, um, we leave it to the market to determine? No, you cannot leave it to it because people need to have okay accommodation, and there's a surplus accommodation which are rent, and therefore ceilings are important. And this is not new. When you look at France, okay, Paris. And you look at New York, there is the rent ceilings. Okay? And these are the capitalist economies. But the welfare of the society is important to consider as well. And therefore, these are important factors uh, for us to, to consider. Yeah? Anyone else? Please tell you. I have two questions if I can myself by the production function. So when you say human assets, uh, in some intellectual function, so it's also equals human capital as well, and also physical effort as well? Yes, physical effort as well. Yes, that's correct. So uh, uh, I just want to clarify myself again. So it means uh, you, you said earlier that uh, 
there should be like a social organization like our human to help to help those uh, human you know humans so that they can have you know uh, that equivalent equal, 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 efforts mm -hmm. and then they can contribute yes. to the social yes. yeah. All right. so, because when you go into if you go to be the marginal productivity yes you will be losing out in the yes. process. Yes. However, even in globally, what we are discussing nowadays is the yes. universal income, yes. so that everyone should have accessibility to a certain level of income to live in dignity. Uh -huh. Islam established that. Uh -huh. So you go into the production, uh -huh. but you do not unfortunately get because the turn, return was not good, whatever it was, the company couldn't produce enough, so it, you couldn't get enough salary, uh, and therefore you are supported as a result of that from day to day. Uh, secondly, about the product function, but I see, um, you know, the the variable, the, the other variables in your product functions, all of them are in terms of value. Therefore, all of them are very abstract. So, um, in uh, in, in contrast with, uh, you know, the three conventional utility functions, where um, we always believe that conventional we can always quantify it. So, in that case. How do we, you know, try to visualize it and mm -hmm. function? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Question. You want to bring the year after to the equation? Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. I just want to yeah. ask yeah. I just want to see. Like, like, no, you know, no I, I understand know. that. Um, I mean, there are different proxies we can create. I wouldn't suggest. I wouldn't suggest doing that. But uh, if you want to, you can create different proxies to look at the equivalence in the year after. To judge the judgment of Allah, uh, that there will be some effect. Uh, that can be done, but whether I will support it, no, I wouldn't support it. I think the one of the criticism, the founding fathers of Islamic economics brought against conventional, this simplicity of quantifying. Uh, quantifying seems with the, all those equations and etc. seems very sophisticated, but in reality, is huge simplifications of the real life. Just to give you an example of that, when the financial crisis happened that week, yeah. okay, the late queen of UK had a planned visit to the London Stock Exchange. Okay, uh, She goes and they go into presentations, amazing equations, and poor woman doesn't understand. I don't think that she understood. <laughs> but one thing, wisdom is different than understanding. After seeing all this, she looks at and she says, you have all this, and you couldn't guess this financial crisis? <laughs> hey, that's the important question. Okay? You had all this. They had all this sophistication, all these methods, all this econometry, all this modeling, but they couldn't guess. And this woman could realize that no, this doesn't work. It didn't work. And later, they wrote a huge letter to her to explain what it is, and they accepted that at the end of the day, this is the human behavior. So quantifying that 100% would not give you the result. Because 100% result is a, even when you run an equation, when you get 30%, yeah. you will feel happy. Yeah. Okay, which implies that 70% will fail to explain. Okay? So therefore, quantifying sounds very exciting, but it's a huge simplification because capturing human mind and psychology is not possible. Because if, let's say that, let's go crazy, let's create a proxy to capture hereafter, because we see this businessman or businesswoman doing a lot of charities. And let's say that with this amount of charity, even we put criteria beyond um, 100 million, this person will go to the best place in general, because it's a, this is a very practicing man or woman, and et cetera, okay? But the question will be, Yes, he's gives so or she's giving charity, but what is the source? Uh -huh. So he or she could have not provided enough uh, salaries for the people working there. Polluted environment problems, and except so the quantification would not have look at those aspects. Mm -hmm. Look at how much charity he or she is giving, and therefore I allocated level four in the hereafter. Let's say, okay. So, but what I'm trying to say, of course, the difficulty of capture. Because what is important for us to understand, one, what is the source, what is the use, what is the impact, okay? So what is the source, whether, whether, it, whether it's halal or not? So we see a lot of businessmen and women, Muslim, Islamically oriented. When it comes to giving the right of all the stakeholders, they are very mean. But when it comes to charity, because they think that they will go to higher ranking in the hereafter, they are very good construction of mosques and the charities and etc. 
But your responsibility was to give the salary to them. Look after the environment that you were piloting and access. Without ensuring that the equation that you had, you mm -hmm. cannot reach that. Okay. Um, if that is so, um, how do you counter argue uh, the people who would say that you just come and be quiet, so it's not that very scientific? Like, you know, just... hmm. That's a, that's a very good word. Uh, word I do not want to go into that discussion now. But what do we mean by science? That's, that's the question. You see, therefore I start with ontology. Therefore I ask the questions: What is black and white and all this? So therefore, whatever we call scientific is a product of enlightenment. Enlightenment ideology based on enlightenment philosophy is based on all the studies that it is me who determines everything. And therefore, I have to maximize that. So science for this out. Okay? Um, however, by 1970s, everyone realized that, look, this modern knowledge is not solving anything. Therefore, postmodernity emerged. What postmodernity told you? Yes, um, every knowledge base has some cognitive realities, cognitive rationality, sorry. OK, Islam or Bangladeshi society or Saudi society, they can be as rational. Habermas, one of the leading individuals in modernist theory, okay? mm -hmm. he would say that he realized, he realized that there are other cognitive rationalism when he saw all these Turks moving to Germany. He's a German. He saw that, he said that I saw them they are as rational as me, but they are Muslims. They have a different background. You see, therefore, what is scientific? So therefore, that scientific understanding that has been imposed on us as a uh, as a box, and then we, we are trying to mingle around it, it didn't help anyone. And therefore, all this uh, postmodernity, the coloniality, and etc., all these new emergences, challenges that scientific, suggesting that whatever you are doing by referring to Quran is exactly. And strangely enough, for instance, in the Western part of the world, nowadays Islamic finance can be accepted. London is trying to become a hub of Islamic finance, like Sambrook, and etc. When it comes to money, that cognitive differences is accepted. So in a legal system, which is based on entirely rationalism, would accept the fatwa of the Sharia scholars giving fatwa for the British scoop, okay? As a rational legal system, which does not accept it because irrational, Islamic, okay? So when it comes to money, it's very easy, but the journals would not move to accept your paper because you have caught it and a verse in the Quran. Okay? So what is scientific there? And I think these are the um, these are the um, terms imposed on everyone. But it is it is good to see that that now the knowledge coming from your part of the world, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and etc., is becoming less valuable. Important centers are emerging. Okay, and, and therefore, I, hopefully, we will get out of this so-called imposed scientific understanding. Excuse me. I think her intent is actually valid. Her intent is, I mean, I'm also interested to operationalize your Fala function. Mm -hmm. But then again, when we talk about proxies, proxies, you say you don't like proxies. When you say, uh, so what is the... I, I don't say that I don't like we, the proxies. If you can so just you, you operationalize so, it. Therefore, I, I mentioned two okay. things. The source, use, and impact. Okay, so if a person earned this money, and gave the charity. So, and if you want to create a proxy for the year after, you're most welcome to the year. As long as you can at the same time to show that, look, this guy gave this amount of money to charity and the sources of this money was acceptable halal. Okay, the use of that was halal and therefore the impact in the hereafter will be accepted. As long as you can do that, I don't have any problem. Whether I will support that's another issue, but I don't have any problem. So you have to qualify, like ESG, when you are looking at ESG, you look at each company, where they invested, how they invested, what they produce, and etc. Similar thing, if you can do that, whether I would support another issue, but I would accept that, scientifically. Okay, yes. Yeah. So allow me, uh, I'm glad to introduce myself. Uh, yeah, why Musharraf uh, and Mubarak and Bank 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 and
Currently, when you look at the legal system, uh, there's a particular definition is a number of people coming together, putting capital together, and having an um, entirely um, um, beyond each individual's um, um, existence, they create an entity. It is an entity beyond you and me as a person. So then we become uh, shareholders in that company. Okay? So it does not, therefore, have a real entity. I am real entity. When you go to SMEs around, they are all real entities. Okay? Yeah. However, corporations, whether banks or big companies, and etc., they are not real entities. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are limited liability. Okay? So when, as an SME, you collapse, you pay everything. Okay? Okay. So, however, as a bank or as a big corporation, you collapse, you don't pay anything. Mm -hmm. So that gives them the debt opportunity to trade, to protect the capital owners. And therefore, Islam does not accept it. As part of the Islamic social for one capital admission. Second, you cannot have non real entity going into transaction. Transaction can be between real entities. So that's the Islamic position. But that was answer your question? Yes, I think it's a clear picture. And if there is a capital on the corporation, is it the debt carried that the other bank will be the corporation? Uh, no, again, the, the limited because it is not mine or your debt, it is the company's debt. It's nothing to do with it. It will not be true. So, 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 how do you think it's not accepted? Well, therefore, Islam doesn't accept that entity by definition. Okay? So, therefore, it wouldn't be. But in the current form, of course, uh, the Sharia courts have to sit around to look into how we can go around and define that. Okay? Well, uh, I have to shut the question. Uh, you used a lot of terms for Islamic politics and economy, yet what is Islamic moral economy? Why not just use Islamic economy to have the heavy moral? Because when you need to make more values and more values, when you mention about economies, it, or, uh, it incorporates more things, not only the classical economy, but then they also incorporate other than both things. They come in there. No, 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 it's the other way around. If you look at the emergence of the science, we use the scientific economics. Economics is very new. The origin of the story is political economics. Adam Smith, Ricardo, John Stark, Miller, etc. They were not economics. They were not economics. They were political economics. What's the distinction? Unfortunately, we couldn't go through the slides, but what is political economy? What we, they define as ecumenical. What is ecumenical is the totality. Okay, that's, that comes the equivalence to tapi, the totality. Okay? So totality means that you, in your analysis, you incorporate everything. When it comes to economics, you only look at the relationship between agents. That's only. However, in political economy, you would consider the source of knowledge, you would consider the relationship with politics and the structures. It is not the agency, but the agency's relationship with others. The, the, the structures and all that. Yeah? The 
this comprehensive explanation. So when you mention on political philosophy, so you kind of already take out the psychology as as uh, aspect like no, you have no, 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 no. And that's what that's why it's a term in clinical so totality. Therefore, political economy is an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, yes, it is interdisciplinary in order to overcome the exclusion of economics because economics is excluded from sociology, is excluded from psychology, is excluded from politics. But political economy is a totality of that. Islam is a totality as well, it's the copy. And the moral economy is the substance. What is the substance? As we refer, it is not having commodification. Okay, not having the fictitiousness, uh, having the importance of community, solidarity, and etc., and how we determine the prices and all that, that's the moral economy part. So you don't need to just, 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 uh, just no, I yes, think economics is a value modern term. Economic is maximization, rational in nature. Islam defines, however, human and then it's got the color in nature, a subjective side. So and therefore the insight. Suggest an entirely different world than the economics itself. Yeah, I think uh, we have um, a question also from online. Um, we'll just take this and then maybe we'll wrap it up. Um, Afrad, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here, Dr. Riyasad. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. You can go ahead. Assalamualaikum. Yeah, assalamualaikum. Yeah, okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Mehmet, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask: uh, Is it uh, possible, yeah, to to do simulation uh, regarding your uh, uh, model in this uh, Islamic moral uh, political uh, economy, yeah? Uh, since uh, in management Which part science, are you uh, uh, actually I, I I skip most of the part because uh, I'm doing a multitasking and right now I'm I'm driving and I'm pulling over. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as well as especially, I want to contextualize that uh, I mean, uh, you connect uh, one of your models. to follow function or the modes of production because each one of them will have different implications. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, what I would like to uh, uh, specify is uh, how you connect to the current uh, digital landscape uh, with the halal entrepreneurs, uh, maybe from the production side. So how digital halal entrepreneur can be uh, simulate uh, within your production uh, model. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, further able elaboration, or, or maybe uh, it is pos possible for future uh, research? Uh, since uh, I have a fellow in KUST, uh, King Abdullah University, Science of Technology, who who do a lot of uh, system dynamic uh, modeling. Uh, thank you, Prof. I hope uh, my question is. Uh, uh, no, I understand your question, but um, I do not know how much you captured my lecture. Therefore, um, I do not know how to respond yeah. to that. Now, the digital part, if you look at the modes of production that I presented, the production function, it does not refer who produces what. Uh, sorry, who, it doesn't look at the who produces, but it looks at what is produced and what the uh, what the um, what the particular stakeholder did. So we look mm -hmm. at uh, we looked at um, in terms of capital. In terms of uh, human uh, effort, land, environment, and society, and other stakeholders. Now, here, each one of them does not go to the equation um, either as a technological innovator or technological yeah. user or manufacturer. We are looking at particular uh, input that goes into the process. What's the source of that input, whether it's from digital economy or non digital economy, or it is manufacturing? It doesn't go into. If you are familiar with production function, you will see that. Mm. Having said that, however, you can do a simulation with the mm. modes of production that I presented here as the equation, um, and mm. you can even do how socialism, how it will compare to socialist modes of production or the production function and the capitalist production function. That mm. you can do that. And a student in Durham, uh, he looked at, for instance, uh, economic crime generation potential of Islamic economy, uh, yeah. communist economy, and the socialist economy, and capitalist economy through simulation. So with simulation, right. we can do that. Uh, but That's whether nice. we can bring the digitality into that, because in the equation, we do not look at the source who generates it, um, but yeah. we look at directly the input, rather than uh, who owns the input. 
I hope that explains. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, Mehmet. Uh, uh, Inshallah, I will try to email uh, uh, potential yes, yes, to, your, uh, to your email. Yeah, thank you, yeah, Prof. Okay, Dr. Yasin sure. and all. Assalamualaikum. Salam from Indonesia. Thank you, Prof. Uh, that brings us to our uh, the end of uh, today's session. I would like to thank um, everybody for their interest and uh, time for coming. I'm sure we all benefited immensely from this unique uh, conversation. We also have, I'd also like to thank our online participants. We had at least 40 when I last checked. Um, and um, also uh, something I had neglected to mention earlier was our gratitude to um, UTM for uh, allowing us to, you know, uh, I, I guess you can say borrow <laughs> from Mehmet Asadi because he has actually come uh, under there um, for a program for them. And um, we were allowed to actually make, take full use of him and take advantage of having Prof. Mehmet here as well. So we are very grateful for their generosity and we hope that, you know, um, we'll obviously, hopefully we can reciprocate in a similar way. So whenever we get speakers, and that would be an on, uh, you know, uh, a development of a good relationship between our institutions. So um, thank you very much. And uh, with that, I would like to call this session to an end. Uh, and I would like to invite. Uh, yeah, we can take a photo, but maybe just yeah, maybe just outside because here um, the venue is a bit too wide and. So I think um, we'll have a photo session outside, so maybe everybody can go outside. Can somebody take an online picture at least? Or, right. Um, but before we do, um, I would like to invite um, uh, um, the director of CIE, Prof. Norma, to give a token of appreciation to Prof. Mehmet before we go out for that photo session. I'll, 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 I'll